In this video, I'm going to share a bunch of tips on how to prove math theorems. And math theorems can often be a little bit scary and a little bit challenging for students who are just starting out their journey on proving math theorems. Indeed, it's often the case in first and second year math courses at university that students are expected to show a lot of procedural fluency with computations. And so when it comes to transition to be able to prove things, it can be a little bit challenging. So in this video, I really want to give you some tools, some ways to scaffold your thinking so that you can at least have some opening moves to get started on whatever it is that you might want to prove. In the first portion of the video, I'm going to focus more on the logic behind different types of proofs. And in the final half of the video, I'm going to talk more about how you come up with the ideas to proceed in your mathematical proof. All right, so step one that I always like to do first is to identify the logical structure of whatever it is that I'm tasked with proving. The most common one that you're going to see is going to be conditional probabilities. P implies Q. Whenever you see this symbol with this arrow, what it means is that you have some assumptions P and you're trying to prove some conclusion Q. It's an if-then statement. So as an example, I could say, if I love my wife, then I'll do the dishes, or something like this. It's got an assumption, and it's got a conclusion. And this basic structure is there regardless of the actual details of the assumption, the details of the conclusion. So, for example, consider this claim. If x is an even number, then x squared is an even number. That is also a mathematical claim that is also in the structure of a conditional statement. And often proofs aren't written quite so clearly as an if, some assumptions, then some conclusions. We may have sort of turned the words around, but if you can take whatever is given and interpret it in this way, where you've got an assumption and a conclusion, and it's saying if the assumption, then the conclusion, then that's going to be very useful for coming up with a strategy to actually prove this claim. Now, conditional statements are not the only type of statements. I actually put up a list of a bunch of different types of possible logical structures that your claim has. It might, for example, the second line be a biconditional. Biconditionals are interesting because they're kind of like two different conditions at the same time. You're saying if P then Q and if Q then P. If you have a biconditional, you have really two proofs that you have to do, showing the one direction and the other. Sometimes, however, it's not structured as a statement. Like, for example, the claim there are infinitely many prime numbers. Sometimes you have a P and a Q or a P or a Q. And sometimes you have structures where what you're really trying to do is show that there exists, this is what the backwards E means, there exists some value that obeys some properties. An example of this might be like, there exists an oldest human on planet Earth. Okay, so after you've analyzed the sort of logical structure and try to figure out what you're doing, the next step would be to try to figure out, well, what method are you going to use to prove it? And there's actually a bunch of different methods, and it depends on what the structure of the claim was. So going to the most common one, the proof methods for a conditional, a if P then Q. Well, it turns out there's a bunch of different methods that you can use to prove a conditional like this. The most sort of direct one is, well, uninspiringly called a direct proof. It says, just assume the assumption, which is P, and then you do some sort of manipulations until you have managed to conclude the conclusion Q. You just basically start at the assumptions and move directly towards the conclusions, and probably the most common proof structure you'll see. But there's others. For example, there's the contrapositive. Contrapositive goes the other way around. It says, let me assume that the conclusion is false. That is, let me assume not Q. This little squiggle here means not. So let, let me assume the conclusion is false, and then I'll continue to do some manipulations until I can finally conclude the negation of the assumption. As, and that is, I want to conclude not P. Indeed, going the contrapositive for the claim that if x is even, x squared is even, would be that x squared is not even implies that x is not even. And indeed, both of these are logically equivalent. It doesn't matter what you do, but one of them might be easier for you than the other. So they're both logically the same, but you might have a preference for them based on the complications in the manipulations that you need to do. Another method that's common is the method of contradiction, and it says, well, I have my assumption P already, but let me also assume that my conclusion is false. And if you do some manipulation where you're taking this uh, you know, initial assumption P and you're assuming the conclusion is false and you get some nonsense like 0 is equal to 1 or X is even and odd at the same time or, or something is literally independent and dependent at the same time, if you get some contradiction like this, then it must be your, your assumption, the not Q, could not have been the case. 
And so that is another method to be able to prove things. And then the final method is actually not when you want to prove something, it's when you want to prove a conditional is false. And that's the method of counterexample. So, so this is not me proving P implies Q, it's me showing that P implies Q is false. Well, for a counterexample, I just need to give you one example, one instance where the assumption is satisfied, but the conclusion is not. And it's important to note that counterexample is really quite fundamentally different from the other three. This is because for the direct proof and contrapositive and contradiction, we're showing them in complete generality. But for counterexample, we can just use one specific concrete example. That's sufficient. Indeed, one of the most common errors that I see as a professor who grades people trying to do proofs is where someone does a proof by example and they try to do a direct proof and they show it's true in one example, but not show it's true in all examples. And so that's a very important distinction. Now, to be fair, you might not know which of these methods you need to begin with until you really understand what proof is asking, but we're just showing at this stage what the possibilities might be. Now, the reason I really like this is because the way I think about proofs is I start with some assumptions, and then I continue doing manipulations until I get to my conclusion. And what those different proof methods does is it tells you what should you put in for the assumption and what should you put in for the conclusion. If you're doing a direct proof or counterpositive, the assumption and the conclusion might differ. The next strategy might seem obvious, but it's actually super important and for people who are at the beginning of their proof journey, a very easy one to miss. And that's just write down the definitions of every word in your assumptions and in your conclusions. This is gonna give you your first trick to being able to proceed in your proof. So remember we were just talking about how you might have assumptions and conclusions? Well, write down the definition of the words in the assumptions and write down the definition of the words in the conclusions, their mathematical precise definition. And then what is in the middle? Well, the middle, what I call the step three here, is just the manipulations, all the ways that you can connect the top to the bottom, all the ways that you can go from your definition of your assumption down to the definition of your conclusion. Uh, that's sort of the hard part, but by scaffolding it this way with assumption, conclusion, definition of assumption, and definition of conclusion, it will hopefully sort of make the gap between these where you have to do your manipulations a bit smaller. Okay, so let's see an example uh, in the case where we had if x was even then x squared was even, I can write down my assumption and my conclusion. So my assumption is that x is even and my conclusion is that, well, x squared is even. So I just write those down at the beginning and the end of my proof. And the next thing I have to do is, well, what do I mean by even? What is the definition of that? And even has a very precise definition. It means it's twice an integer. So for example, six is twice three and eight is twice four and so forth. And so I'm gonna write down what my definitions are. My definition is that x is 2p, where p is an integer, and my definition of my conclusion, which is that x squared is even, is that x squared is equal to 2q, where q is an integer. One of the things that happens in this stage is you often want to introduce variable names. I mean, in both cases of the assumption and the conclusion, I'm introducing an integer, but I don't want to repeat myself because they're representing both x or x squared respectively, so I use p for the x and q for the x squared. So part of your proof will involve defining some notation like this. In this case, I'm defining where the p lives, it's an integer, and where the q lives, it's also an integer. Okay, so now we have the manipulations. And that, again, is the hard part, but, I mean, if you want to, you could... But now we have manipulations, and if you wish, you can always pause the video and try to see it before I'm going to spoil it for you. Okay, next step. I want to try to figure out those manipulations, but how do I do this? Well, I really want to have a goal of going towards whatever that conclusion is. I know I'm at the assumption, that's my sort of starting spot, and I want to head in the direction of the conclusion. So what we were just looking at with this x even implies x squared even, because the conclusion has something to do with x squared, there's really a very natural manipulation to do. I have an x, I want to get to an x squared, so if I'm looking at the conclusion and trying to make what I have look like what I want, the natural thing to do is to square my x. And so that's what I do for manipulation. I square it, and I notice that this is gonna give me four p squared. And since I want to write that x squared as twice something, so I just factor a two out and write this as two times two p squared. And then that's exactly of the form two times something, where that something is this two p squared, and I'll just call that q. So define my q, and that out is my proof. This is a complete proof of this particular claim. So the point here was that I found a direction for what manipulations I should do by saying I want my assumptions to look like the conclusions, which meant I had to square it and write it as twice something, and that gave me all the ideas that I needed for my manipulations. So 
That was some of the scaffolding, the sort of logical structures that I like to think about when coming up with my proof. And now we actually have to proceed to something. We actually have to proceed to those manipulations. And maybe even if you aim for manipulations, you don't see a path forward. And in fact, everything that you've done previously could almost be done without having any idea about what the statement meant at all, which is sort of a bit bizarre. Perhaps you want to try to understand the statement first. Maybe that should be step one. But I'm putting it down here because this is when it really transitions to not just following this cookie cutter method that I've outlined, but to actually using your own intuition, your own understanding. So I really try to read the statement and try to understand what is it asking? What does the assumption mean? What does it mathematical mean? What does the conclusion mean? What does this connection sort of feel like or look like? And I try to really have a nice sort of large scale understanding of what this is actually asking before I try to actually go and prove it. The next thing I really like to do is to, well, it's just basically draw a picture. It depends on what type of proof it's gonna be. This business with the X squared, well, there wasn't really a nice natural geometric picture. But for example, in linear algebra, there's all kinds of beautiful pictures that you wanna draw. So does your statement that you're trying to prove, could you represent it geometrically? Could you draw a picture that interprets the assumptions or interprets the conclusion and tries to see how those might be connected? If you can draw a picture, a lot of the time, mathematics is just writing down the picture that you're able to draw. So I'd really encourage you to try to come up with a beautiful geometric picture if you can. The next thing I really like to do is to come up with some specific examples. I mean, I already talked about how you cannot use a concrete example as your proof. But that doesn't mean concrete examples are pointless. Indeed, a concrete example is extremely valuable for giving you intuition. So I would put in some numbers. I would choose a specific instance and I would try and compute it out in that specific instance and see why might the conclusion be connected to the assumption? Can I understand that in one concrete example? If I can do it once, I might be able to then generalize and prove it arbitrarily. Indeed, this sort of connects to the point of drawing a geometric picture. Maybe you want to draw the geometric picture in a specific example, something that you know about. Indeed, anytime I'm learning a new mathematics field, if there's some new definitions, I always try to write down as many little examples as I can that explore a specific definition. So I get the idea of a basis. I just try to draw as many little examples of the basis until I understand what is a basis, what is not a basis. And I feel that sort of doing that exploring through canonical examples is an extremely important part of doing mathematics. The next thing I often look for if I'm not getting any ideas is what are the relevant theorems about the kind of mathematical objects that I'm talking about? So when I look at the assumptions, when I look at the conclusions, I want to know what are the major theorems that we see? So if you're in a course, you'll often get these from your textbook and it'll be taught about in class. These are the major ideas that you need. Indeed, a lot of proofs are basically just write down the definitions, see what theorems apply, and sort of connect those together to get to the assumptions. And that's sort of the core math is just linking one or two theorems to the definitions that you actually have. And so I really encourage you to sort of see what's available here. And if you want to, you could even go a little bit further. This doesn't always work, but sometimes if you read the proofs of the relevant theorems, then that can give you ideas for the types of manipulations people do with the objects that are in the theorem that you're talking about. And then the final thing I'm gonna talk about is really just to sort of play around. I noticed that when I was younger and I would try to prove something that I got challenging, I got stuck on, well, it would often feel a little bit discouraging. I might not want to continue. The obvious first thing I tried, it didn't work. Well, I'd really encourage you to treat proving things as a more iterative process, where you can keep on playing around, trying new examples, trying new ideas, see if you can connect a new theorem in, see if there's some way you can visualize it. All these things we've talked about, just keep playing around and hopefully you're going to get some insight as how you can proceed forward. And often you find that you go down a weird rabbit hole and you've been doing all of this trying to do a direct proof, but perhaps the contrapositive, it fell really easy. So just because one method is really not proving fruitful doesn't necessarily mean that this theorem is impossible or that you're not in any way capable of doing it. It just means maybe you have to play around to get that sort of key insight to look at this problem a little bit differently. I'll say for myself that I originally started university as a physicist. That's what I thought I wanted to go into. I wanted to go into physics, but it was through exposure to mathematical proofs. And I really just fell in love with the sort of way that two people could communicate through completely logical, rigorous arguments. And one could convince the other of this by the proof. I just love that whole idea. And it really drew me towards mathematics where I eventually went and became a math professor.
So I would encourage you to stick with your proving because it really can be very rewarding. Now, if you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like for the YouTube algorithm. If you have any questions about the video, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.